Good morning, everyone. I was just told I have to keep it on the stand, so I will do that. You know, it's an exciting series of studies that we're involved in right now called Preparation for the End Time. And that could sound a little intimidating, but actually, it's really good news because I believe that Jesus wants us all to be joyfully waiting for His return. Amen? Now, we're passing out a blue sheet to you. That is the same outline that Lauren and Ben and Gilbert, Gilbert and Rachel have. And so we, uh, we want you to follow along with us. I'm just going to put that down there so I can see their name tags a little better. The Word of God is living and active. And as we study today about the attempt to change God's law, our goal is that we would be determined in our hearts to be loyal to our Savior and to follow the teaching of His Word. Before we open the Word together, is there anyone who didn't get a blue sheet? Just wave if you didn't get a blue outline. Oh, we need some in the front over here, Chris. We want to make sure each one of you has one of the outlines. You can download that from our website, hopetv.org slash hopess, or if you have the Hope Channel app on your phone or iPad, you can also print out the outline. Look at that. So many people are wanting to be involved with Sabbath School today. We're just glad that you're part of our class. And you're joining more than a million Hope Sabbath School members around the world in 150 countries who are studying the Word of God with us each week. So we're going to start with the last book of the Old Testament, and I'm going to ask uh, Gilbert if you'd begin our study today. The last book of the Old Testament is the prophet Malachi, and we're going to look in Malachi chapter 3, verse 6. Feel free to follow along in your outline and follow along in your Bible as we read about the law of God and the character of God. So Gilbert, uh, Malachi 3 and verse 6, if you'd read that for us. Malachi 3 verse 6, it reads, For I am the Lord, I do not change. Therefore you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. Now part of the character of God, of course, is his, his immeasurable, unfailing love. And we can be thankful for that, otherwise we would be consumed. He says, you're not consumed because I am the Lord and I, I change not. That's right. So with that in mind, go over to the book of Hebrews. And Lauren, if you could read for us from Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 8. It shouldn't surprise us that the author of Hebrews describes the Son of God who came into humanity, Jesus, uh, with the same words. Let's see how that reads in uh, Hebrews 13 and verse 8. I'm reading from the King James Version. It reads, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. Amen. I heard one amen from someone on row three. Is that good news that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever? Now, sometimes people get confused. I, I got a whole pile of emails a few weeks ago because I said Jesus was not the creator. And people got all upset with me. But Jesus was born 2,000 years ago. The Son of God, the Word, who was with God and was God, He's the Creator who came into humanity about 2,000 years ago, and His name was Jesus of Nazareth, right? So the author, when he says Jesus the same yesterday, today, and forever, is recognizing the pre-existence of the Son of God from eternity past. That's why he could say, before Abraham was, I am. You see, that doesn't sound like good grammar. But he is, I am. That's Yahweh. That's the name of God. Jesus, the same yesterday, today, and forever. So with that in mind, Ben, let's look in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 and 18. Jesus has obviously been accused of trying to destroy the law. Actually, Jesus opposed man-made tradition. But notice what uh, Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount. Ben, how does that read from your Bible? Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, 
but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. What's Jesus saying? They're saying you've come to destroy the law, and what does Jesus say? I've come to fulfill it. I've come to exalt it. In fact, I've come to give you a clearer understanding of what it means, which brings us now to Matthew chapter 5. And Rachel, if you could read verses 21 and 22, and then uh, Gilbert, if you could read 27 and 28. Some people say, well, Jesus did away with the letter of the law, and he introduced the spirit of the law. Well, let's listen and see what Jesus says. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment, and whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says, you fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. And before we comment on that, Gilbert, if you could read the next two verses, 27 and 28. You have heard that it is said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So I need some help from someone out here in our group or someone on our team here. Is Jesus doing away with the command that you shouldn't kill? Yes or no? Not at all. Is he doing away with the command that you shouldn't commit adultery? Not at all. He's not doing away with that. So what is he doing, someone in the group? If he's not doing away with the, the law, what, what's he doing, Lauren? He's, he's saying that's true, that you shouldn't murder. I'm agreeing with that. And to take it even further, don't, don't murder in your heart. I care about the feelings that you have as well and, and what you intend in your heart. So he's agreeing with it and taking it even further. So if I was a legalist, I could say to, uh, to one of you here, well, you know, I, uh, I didn't kill you, so I'm obeying the law. I could hate you. I could say all manner of evil against you. And I'd still be obeying the letter of the law because I didn't kill you. Jesus is saying, let's go beyond the letter to the to the spirit of the law. And what is the ultimate spirit of the law? Love. To love. Who said that? Thank you. It's to love. Love is the fulfillment. Now, it doesn't mean as long as I love, I can kill you or I can commit adultery with your spouse as long as I love. No, no, no. If you love, you'll not only keep the letter of the law, but you'll also keep the spirit of the law. You could think about that with any of the commandments. So let's take the Sabbath, because we're studying about the attempt to change God's law. A person says, well, I don't work from sundown on Friday to sundown on Saturday. Are they keeping the fourth commandment? What do you think? Possibly? Partially, okay. So what would be the true fulfillment of that beautiful command to remember the Sabbath, to keep it holy. To worship the Lord. Thank you, Lewis. And to worship Him, my heart filled with love. Thank you. The Lord of the Sabbath would look at us coming together here at Vallejo Drive or wherever we are and just worshiping Him with our hearts filled with love and say, that's what the Sabbath is about. Amen? So the idea that Jesus, when he said, you've heard this, but I say this, that that is doing away with the commandments of God is, is a ridiculous idea. He's exalting these principles to a whole new level. All right, let's keep studying here. Romans chapter 12. Welcome to... I'm looking. Carlene? Darlene, thank you. You have to turn a little and I'll see your name tag. Darlene, we're glad you're here. 
I'm going to ask Ben if you could read for us from Romans chapter 7 and verse 12. And then I have a question for us, okay? We're talking about the fact that God doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he says, my law doesn't change. Not one jot or tittle, we read. What does it say in Romans 7 and verse 12? So then, the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, righteous and good. Now, he's just spent the whole book of Romans telling us we can't be saved by law-keeping. There's only one way we're saved. How are we saved? By Jesus, that's right. By grace, you're saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. So, some people said, well... If we're not saved by keeping the law, then, then you're opposed to the law. And what did Ben read? The law is, is holy and righteous and it's good. There's nothing wrong with these principles of, that reflect the character of God. He's just saying that's not the way we, we don't earn salvation. Rather, our Obedience is a reflection of our, of our love, of our relationship with him. So here's a question for the whole group, including those of us up here. Darlene, again, welcome. You'll be sharing a microphone with Gilbert right there. Why is it important that we understand the unchangeable nature of God's law as we pre prepare for the end time? Why is that important? Why does it matter? What do you think? Anybody? Why is it important that we understand the unchangeable nature, both of God's character and his law, as we prepare for the end time? Anybody want to try an answer to that? Gilbert, what do you think? So some, sometimes I reflect on the character of Jesus as reflected in the Bible, and I wonder, is God exactly like Jesus? If he is, then we are safe, you know, because he's loving, he's caring. I'm imagining uh, the highest authority having those characteristics. Mm. And to just give it context, I come from a country where there is dictatorship. Mm. So, you know, when leadership is bad, it cascades and filters down and, you know, consequently have bad governance. But, so I imagine the exact character of Christ being soft, forgiving, caring, and that being the same with God, and it not being changing. I think it kind of gives me comfort and security that, you know, even in eternity, we will have a good God with good governance. Mm. You know, we know there's going to be a time of trouble such as never was. That's what Scripture tells us. Is it not encouraging to know that God won't change? Amen. And as Gilbert said, if you want to know the character of God in a very tangible way, Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So get acquainted. Now, I've been teaching a class on the life of Jesus for the last 20 years or so, and I... I'm not shocked anymore, but I'm still perplexed that many of the young people who grew up in Christian families have never read one of the Gospels. Never. They maybe hear John 3.16, which says, for God so loved the world, or maybe John 14, verse 1, which says, let not your heart be troubled, or maybe Matthew 7, verse 12, I'm doing a quiz for you here, which says, treat others as you would like to be treated. But do you know many young people have never read through one of the Gospels? These are the inspired testimonies about the character of God revealed in His Son, Jesus. And they've never read them. Now today, you can listen to them while you're exercising. You can watch the Matthew video or the John video. We ought to be acquainted with the character of our Savior. Amen? So please, take some time while you're cooking, while you're exercising, while you're driving. Listen to Scripture. Let it fill your heart. And start with the Gospels, because there is the clearest revelation 
And Gilbert says, as we enter troubled times, what a wonderful assurance to know that our God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen? But now we go to a prophecy in Daniel. And Darlene, I'm going to ask you to read the passage for us. We're going to Daniel chapter 7. If you're following along in your Bible, Daniel chapter 7 and verse 25. Now before Darlene reads for us, I have a question for someone out here in our group or someone on the platform. What is the book of Daniel about? What's it about? It, it, it's got a lot of prophecy in it, right? It's about what's going to happen in the end and also the stories, Daniel chapter 1, Daniel chapter 3, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, reverse lesson in Daniel 4 with the proud Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel chapter 6 with the lion's den. It's not only telling us what's going to happen, but it's telling us how we should live. Are you with me? Death decree in Daniel 3, death decree in Daniel 6, both groups, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel, determined that they would do what? Help me now. They do what? They would stand true to God, no matter what the consequence. I love that passage in Daniel 3. You remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? They said, our God, whom we serve, is what? He's able to deliver us. But even if he chooses not to, we still won't bow down. Amen. Because ultimately they knew that he could raise them from the dead. So even if he chooses not to deliver us from this fire, we still will not bow down. So the book of Daniel is about the things that will happen between then and the end, and also how we should live. What about Daniel 7? What is that? Is that a story or a prophecy? It's a prophecy. Thank you. And it parallels Daniel chapter 2. Now we, we move from a metal man. Do you remember the metal man in Daniel 2? Those of you who studied your Bible. With the head of gold. That represented Babylon, right? And the chest and arms of silver. Medo-Persia. Thank you, Ben. And, and the, the thigh of brass. And that was Greece. And then the, the iron legs, which represented the iron monarchy of Rome. And then the feet of iron and clay, the, the divided empire that would never be reunited, though they would try to reunite. I was born in the UK. People said, oh, finally, the EU is going to unite it, and now Brexit. <laughs> they're not going to cleave together. Now there are others who are wondering if they should leave. But even when they're together, they're not together fully. And in the midst of the prophecy in Daniel 7... Got your Bible, and I'm going to ask Darlene if you'd read. Daniel 7 and verse 25 is a, is a startling prophecy. How does that read in your Bible, Darlene? And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of time. Who's the he? Who's the he that will speak pompous words against the Most High? If you look there, it is a little horn. Okay? It's rising up out of the fourth beast. So that means a power, a horn is a power, is going to rise up out of the fourth beast. Who's the fourth beast? Rome. Thank you. Paralleling the legs of iron is this nondescript beast with iron teeth and iron claws. It's a clear parallel to the metal man in Daniel 2. And out of the Roman Empire, a power is going to rise, but it's different from the other powers because it not only exercises political power and military power, but it exercises religious power and it actually speaks words against the Most High. And, and startling, not only does it speak words, what else does it do? It persecutes the saints. Question. Why would a religious power persecute 
the saints of the Most High God. That doesn't make sense, does it? Why would a religious power persecute, Rachel, the saints of the Most High God? You'd think that they would be encouraging the saints of the Most High God. Control. Control? Because if other people, if others do not agree with what they're teaching, they won't be able to... Hold, hold the mic close. If, if others aren't, aren't doing what, what they are teaching, then... So you would say it's a desire to control that they would persecute people who disagreed with them. By the way, this little horn power it's is... It's political control. Okay. Do you know who the little horn power is? It's us. It's the Christian church. Now that's kind of troubling. But the prophecy was that the Christian church that would apostatize. In fact, in Paul's day it said the apostasy is already at work. It began to turn away from the things of God. And Rachel, if you turn away from the authority of God's word, then you have to use your own authority and try to enforce what you want to happen, right? Absolutely. Now, I just want to say this. I want you to listen to me very carefully. Because sometimes we can be critical of the history of the church. But within the Christian church, there were men and women who gave their lives because they wanted the church to get back to the Bible. Amen? Yes, they did. They were priests. They were monks. They were nuns who believed that their church had gone astray and that we needed to come back to the Bible. So just remember that as we talk about the apostasy and what we call the Reformation to protest, Protestant, to call us back to the Bible. So, here's the key question now. What did the Christian church do to try to change the law of God? Times and laws. Well, it doesn't tell us, does it, in, the, in Daniel chapter 7. But uh, what do we know from history? Times. But there's only one command of God that deals with time that I can think of. What's that? The fourth commandment, which says what? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Now, if you look in, in church history, in the early Christian church, and we'll study some text together, but it's very clear that the early Christian community honored the Sabbath. And, depending on where you studied, several generations continued, and some parts of the world, up to 1000 AD, continued to remember the Sabbath. So why, why this uh, departure from the clear teaching of the law of God away from the fourth commandment? Why, why do that? Does anybody know? Why would they do? Why, why don't they just say, we can't do that? What did Peter say? We ought to obey God rather than? So, why would they do that? We have a hand. What's the answer? The day of Sunday, which was the day of Zerga, supposed to be the one. Okay, so we got several. The prince of this world is involved because the Sabbath is a sign that God is our creator, right? So it's not just an a arbitrary day saying keep, twin, keep the fifth day, keep the sixth or first. Or, it's a sign of creatorship. But Orpheus also said when the church embraced... Uh, well, actually, the other way around. When the emperor and the empire embraced Christianity as a legitimate religion, Constantine, 4th century, you get all of these pagans coming in, and they bring pagan practices with them. Okay? And one of those is worship of the sun god. The day of the sun. So you get this challenge. Are we going to obey God's word? He says, I am the Lord and I, I change not. 
and I've not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it, will I honor that, or will I go with the majority? What other things did, did the Christian church during that era, we call it the Dark Ages, what other things they sought to change times and laws? What else did they change? Ten Commandments. Well, you got something in the Ten Commandments because uh, the Second Commandment says what? No graven images. But the pagans had lots of graven images, right? They had lots of idols. And during this time, statues come into the Christian church. And people start praying to, they don't call them demigods, they call them saints. So they start praying to saints and idols, and you can go to parts of the world where they kiss the foot, and it gets all smooth, the rock gets worn out. All of that comes in. Well, how do you get around the fact that the second commandment says, don't make any graven images? The answer is, you pull that one out. And you divide the tenth one. And the fourth commandment becomes the third commandment. Because you're seeking to change the clear teaching of God's word. So what was the motivation for that? Why didn't, why didn't someone just say, we shouldn't worship idols, we shouldn't have statues in our churches, we shouldn't, certainly shouldn't pray to them or venerate them as some sacred object? Why didn't people stand up and say, we can't do that? And the answer is, they did. You got a microphone, Ben. Some people... They did. We, the reformer is like Martin Luther. He did not believe that they were not following Scripture according to what even Paul was writing about being saved by grace and faith. That I think we're all guilty when we get into a position of power, that power can corrupt us. And I think we saw that with the rise of the, the popes and this whole idea of papal infallibility. I think they, there are brothers and sisters, but they lost sight of what truly mattered. So being in a position of power, it's, it's a danger. Mm. And they forgot what really mattered in Scripture. So Ben says, why didn't some people stand up and oppose th that apostasy? And the answer is, they did. And many of them paid for it with their lives. You can read the books of the martyrs. One that is especially dear to my heart is a man named Jan Hus. Do you know where he was from? He's from the, what we now call the Czech Republic. And uh, he was a, uh, a leader of the church there. The church that was in apostasy. And do you know what his real passion was? Do you know why he was executed? Does anybody know? Have you heard of John Hus or Jan Hus? Do you know why he was executed? by the church because he believed that the people should be able to read the Bible in their own language and by the way you know my wife writes scripture songs we sing on Hope Sabbath School do you know that Jan Hus wrote scripture songs he sang one while he was burned at the stake he wrote them so that the people would hide the word of God in their hearts because your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. So why didn't some people say something? Ben says they did. So how did it get to the place? You now mentioned Martin Luther. By the way, they wanted to kill him. How did some of the reformers survive? Why didn't they kill them all? Why didn't the Reformation stop? Anybody know? I, th I think because of compromise on the part of the church then to avoid further persecution and violence, we compromised certain things so that we become accommodative. But I'm wondering why they didn't kill Martin Luther. Anybody know why they didn't kill him? 
why didn't he, why wasn't he killed like many of the other reformers? You're exactly right, my brother. God raised up some German princes who said, this is our territory and you can't just come and kill him. And so Wittenberg was there and the, the, the places, the castles where the princes were, God provided a shelter. Now I want you to know that that didn't happen without a great deal of bloodshed. But we, we are... We, we are the children of the Reformation. Do you know we just celebrated the 500th year of something? What was it the 500th year of? Does anybody know? It was the 500th year of the nailing of the 95 Theses to the door of the church there, right? 500 year anniversary. And some people, religious people said, the Reformation is now over. Yep. We've all come back together again now. Answer? The Reformation has to continue. Right? Well, let's keep going because Jesus has some important words for us here. Let's go to Luke chapter 4 and Luke 23 and John 14. Lauren, if you could read for us Luke 4 because we want to... Really, the key time law that was attacked during this Dark Age period was the Sabbath commandment. Let's go back and see how Jesus related to Sabbath and how the early Christian church related to Sabbath. We're in Luke chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. And it reads, And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, and there went out a fame of him through all the region around about. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. All right. I was in Nazareth uh, two weeks ago. Um, they never found a synagogue there. Uh, hopefully someday they'll find one. But uh, I preached by the Sea of Galilee. There's a synagogue they found in Capernaum. That's where Jairus, remember Jairus, whose daughter died, was raised to life by Jesus. It's all right there. But it says Jesus went. Now, Lauren, I'm going to ask you a question. Someone might say, well, of course he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. He was Jewish. What does that prove? How would you respond to that? Of course he went on the Sabbath day. He was Jewish. What does that prove about how we should be? What would you say? Okay, and didn't Jesus say the Sabbath was made for the human family? Not the human family to keep the Sabbath. It was made for, not just the Jewish people, right? But for, by the way, even if you just go to Sinai, though the Sabbath went all the way back to creation, Sinai is long before there were, was ever... Uh, even then, remember, right? It's not a start then. So it's for all of us. But, but again, someone says, well, yeah, Jesus was Jewish, so he did it. Yes? I have given you an example that as I have <laughs> done, you should do also. Amen. Amen. That was in terms specifically of the foot washing there. But he did say to his disciples, follow Follow me, right? When he went to be baptized, they, John said, you don't need to be baptized. He said, suffer it to be so to fulfill all righteousness. And so the Sabbath, he's opposed to man-made traditions, but the Sabbath is not a man-made tradition. It's a gift of God to all of his creation. So that's why he's there, right? And he's reading the scripture. Let's go to Luke 23. Rachel, could you read that for us? Luke 23, 55 and 56. By the way, if anyone says to you, well, we don't know which day the seventh day is, it's right here in this uh, passage, okay? It's so clear. We're going to read 55 and 56 of Luke 23. And the women who had come with him from Galilee followed after, and they observed the tomb and how his body was laid. 
Then they returned and prepared spices and fragrant oils, and they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. Right there in that passage, Jesus dies. When, what day does he die? On the sixth day, right? And they go preparing for the Sabbath, and then they come on the first day, and the tomb's empty. Sixth day, seventh day, Sabbath, first day. It's interesting, and this is respect. I have many wonderful uh, folks watching Hope Sabbath School who go to church every Sunday. You ask them, which day is the first day? They say Sunday. They don't, they don't say, we don't know. It's Sunday. We even have Easter Sunday, which is the day, where the, probably not by the calendar, but it certainly was the first day that he rose from the dead. But the day before the first day is the seventh day, according to the commandment. That's what we just read. And look at one more verse for us. Uh, Darlene, could you read John 14 and verse 15? I really, this is so simple. It's what we talked to at the beginning about love being the fulfillment of the law. John 14 and verse 15. John 14, verse 15 says, If you love me, keep my commandments. Amen? If you love me, keep my commandments. It could also be translated, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Which is it? It's both. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Love is the fulfillment of the law. So let's look at the early Christian church. We already know that the women rested on the Sabbath before going to embalm the body of Jesus on the first day. When they go, he's not there. He's risen from the dead. But let's look at two passages. Ben, could you read for us in Acts 13 and verse 14? No, you need to use the microphone that uh, Lauren's giving you. Thank you. We'll keep that Luke. one on this side. We're looking at Acts 13 oh, okay. and verse 14. And then verses 42 to 44. If you're following along in your outline, we're now under 3D. It reads, From Perga they went on to Poseidon, Antioch. On the Sabbath they entered the synagogue and sat down. And verses 42 to 44. As Paul and Barnabas were leaving the synagogue, the people invited them to speak further about these things on the next Sabbath. When the congregation was dismissed, many of the Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who talked with them and urged them to continue in the grace of God. On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. Now someone could say, well, of course they went on the Sabbath to the synagogue, that's when people were there. Is that right? It is right, except the next week almost the whole town showed up and he didn't say, will you come back the next Sabbath because Sabbath is a special time for worship. Paul didn't say, oh, you don't need to worry about the Sabbath anymore, I'll come back on Tuesday. I think he probably taught all week, but he was recognizing the significance of Sabbath as sacred time. Are you with me? Look in Acts chapter 16. Gilbert, if you could read verses 12 and 13 for us of Acts 16. Uh, there wasn't even a synagogue here. And let's see what happens. Acts 16 verse 12 and 13. And from there to Philippi, which is the foremost city of the part of Macedonia, a colony and we were staying in that city for some days and on the Sabbath day we went out of the city to the riverside where prayer was customarily made and we sat down and spoke to the women who met there I like this verse um, so what do you do if Sabbath comes and you don't have a place where you can gather uh, to worship You find somewhere. So they said, well, we heard people go out and pray by the river. So they went there. And what was the name of the lady they met there? Do you remember? Lydia. And as a result of that evangelistic meeting, the, her whole family 
is converted. And then there's this demon-possessed girl. Remember her. And then the jailer, because they get thrown in jail, and his whole family. And I was just reading this last week. It says that those people, Lydia, the former demon-possessed girl, and the jailer and his family, became the most loving and devoted followers of Jesus. Isn't that beautiful? He went out on the Sabbath day looking for them. So, here's my question for you. When the reformers rejected many of the non-biblical teachings of the church, Ben mentioned one, salvation by penance or by indulgences, they said, that's wrong. Salvation comes by grace through faith, right? A gift of God. Uh, they rejected that. They rejected other teachings of the church. Why didn't they reject the teaching about first day worship and go back to the Bible teaching of the seventh day Sabbath? What do you think? Help me. Oh, for the religious establishment, you're absolutely right. Um, that They considered it a mark of their authority, and they even challenged the protesters and said, if you're going to go by the Bible, you should be keeping the seventh-day Sabbath. And I say, amen. But they said, if you're going to go by the Bible, the fact that you are still worshiping on the first day is a sign that you recognize our authority to sanctify that day for Christians as a day for worship. So why didn't they change? Help me someone. What do you think? Yes? Was it prejudice regarding the Jewish people? I think that may be part of it. Thank you for pointing that out. In fact, that was a factor even among the early Christians when there was pressure because of, of uh, anti-Semitic feelings. That may have been one thing. Anybody else? What? What may have caused them not to leave this non-biblical teaching? Oh, yeah, it was a fulfillment of the prophecy, certainly, that that, that would continue. Yes. I think you've got, you know, we have the expression, hit the nail on the head. This is just what we do. My mother did this. My grandmother did this. My great-grandmother. And you're telling me that my mother and my grandmother and my great-grandmother, that they were all wrong? And they might add, and they're going to be lost? And the answer is, we're not talking about whether they're going to be lost or not. Because salvation doesn't come by our behavior, but by the grace of God. Maybe they didn't know, but now we know. Amen? We know. But I think you're right. It's just like, that's what we do. This, this is it. And so there were some things that the reformers were very passionate about. And there were other things that they just said, you know, this, this is just what we do. But, back to Ben's comment. Why didn't some people stand up and say, we need to get back to the Bible Sabbath? And the answer is, some did. Study the Reformation. There were some. They were maligned as Sabbatarians who said, well, we also need to get back to the Sabbath because that's biblical. That's what the Bible teaches. And out of that grew some of the Seventh-day Baptists and out of that heritage during the Second Great Awakening was this re-emphasis of let's get back to the Bible teaching. It's hard though, isn't it? There are some Bible verses, yes, that, that some of our dear Christian brothers and sisters may use and want to look at a couple of those as we wrap up our study. I'm just, uh, just wondering if during that Reformation there was such a focus on being saved without works that returning to obedience having any kind of a message to obey the Ten Commandments would just seem out of alignment with the primary message of salvation by faith. And that some people just did not have the ability to distinguish. 
sure. I think that's a really good point. And by the way, uh, our, the prophet that God blessed this movement with is very clear that these men and women were led of God. But the present truth was the whole idea of salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, right? By Christ alone. And that the word of God um, stands and we should follow the word of God. But you do, in later years, get, get the uh, pietists and the later reformers who do say the way we live is also important. But it takes some time for that to happen. Well, our time is going. I've just got a couple of minutes left. I apologize. You know, there are some verses that they use that are used to try to um, explain why we should worship on Sunday. Let me just tell you, you can look them up. None, they reference the first day, but none of them talk about it as a day of worship. Certainly none of them talk about it as a replacement for God's holy Sabbath. What I want us to close with, though, and I'm going to ask Darlene if you read it for us in Revelation chapter 14, is the timely message of the, of the angels, the three angels' messages in Revelation 14, calling us back to worship our Creator, and which commandment emphasizes His creative work? The fourth commandment. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work, and you know not anyone in your household. For in six days the Lord, He made the heaven and the earth. Let's read. Darlene, from Revelation 14, verses 6 and 7. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation, and kindred, and tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God, and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth, and the sea, and the fountains of waters. To summarize that last verse in one sentence, it would say, worship your creator. And that day that he is blessed as a sign of his creative work is the seventh day Sabbath. So what do we do with our dear brothers and sisters who go to church every Sunday, and they're just not convicted that this is important? What do we do? That's right. We'd be an example that when we come to worship Sabbath, we don't do it with some kind of cold legalistic attitude like trying to earn my way to heaven, but we do it to worship and a heart filled with, with love for God. And as one of my colleagues said, well, I think the Sabbath is a possibility, but I'm just not convicted now. I'll say, okay. Keep praying. We'll keep praying. Let's keep living an example of a loving follower of Jesus. Amen? The hour of his judgment has come. We're almost home. He hasn't changed his law. And could we even thank God today for those faithful reformers who shed their blood? Who loved God so much, they said, we will not dishonor him and disobey him. They're going to stand with the redeemed of all of the ages when the saints are gathered together. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the study of your word today. It challenges us to not just do what's convenient or what the majority do, but that which is in harmony with your word. Not to earn your favor, but out of love. And that our lives would be a witness to those around us of what it means to be your follower in these last days. We thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thanks for joining us for Hope Sabbath School today. And uh, God bless you as you continue to study his word.